All righty, Nathaniel, great to have you today. For some quick background, Nathaniel's one of our OG students from New Zealand. Um, he's gone on an amazing ride from King's College, actually both went to the same high school, to Stanford, uh, got into a range of schools and is now building his own venture in Silicon Valley. Welcome, welcome. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jamie, for having me. Um, yeah, I guess we go way back, same school, actually even same house at King's, so yeah. I'm a lot of history there. Kind of crazy. I remember looking at your Common app and um, we, we, we literally, it's like almost like a clone profiles from back in the day so uh yeah it's, it's pretty funny surreal and we're both doing entrepreneurship so it's been a wild ride let's um uh rewind back to new zealand so you're going through school a lot of the students listening to this are thinking about what they want to study in the future where they want to go what universities they're you know trying to get into um they're right in the middle of that so i guess rewinding back to your journey you always had a ton of academic drive since i first met you where did the drive first come from what triggered it at what moment in your education kind of got that going I feel like I've always been really interested in math. Um, so I think there's like an Otago, like math competitions, and like middle school, year nine and 10. Um, I was like very competitive and wanted to do that. So, I, you know, like I took math Olympiads in high school. I think that was like a really big thing. Wanted to like wanting to like work at math outside of just school hours and like do it over the summer. Um, and, I, and I think over the summer, like if you get really interested in these like academic programs, you'll learn so much more than someone who just kind of, you know, like works hard during the school year. And then another thing that got me kind of into academics as well was um, I always had a little bit of an in interest in entrepreneurship. King's Prep had like a little entrepreneurship competition year, right? I don't really know. I got like kind of very into that. Um, I had like a little like few projects and ideas, but I feel just like hacking together a little like apps and like, um, websites on the side of high school also kind of like got me really interested to like computer science and some other things how'd your king's prep venture go did you guys uh make some good revenue yeah like we didn't actually have revenue it was all like you had like a demo app and you created spreadsheets about like oh if we like launched it what would it get but and i and i guess in our heads we convinced ourselves through through the spreadsheets that it was going to be lucrative even if we never sold anything Sounds like a lot of Silicon Valley. No, I'm kidding. Yeah, I guess I just summarized like pre-seed and seed fundraising right there. Nailed it. Love it. Love it. I remember uh, when I was at St. Kent's Prep, we had like a food day thing where we all had to run a food stand and we sold banana splits and like chocolate uh, chocolate covered strawberries. And I, I kind of hacked it a little bit because I got this guy in my group whose dad ran a strawberry farm. So we had no cost on the strawberries. So uh, it was it was hard to beat the team. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately. They caught on to our unlimited supply of strawberries, so it didn't quite go well. But it was a, it was a good enterprise for as long as it lasted. Yeah, it's a, it's a really good uh, situation. Yeah, I remember my sister had something like that, and everyone was like selling little things they made, and they just like drop shipped like a thousand like um, iPhone little like cable like organizers. So they won by uh, by a lot. I love it. That's the hustle. Um, you're mentioning math a little bit, so I guess one thing that really stood out was your you know math Olympiad work in high school. Tell us a little bit about you know, what level you took this to, what it was like training for Math Olympiad, how much time you'd spend on Math Olympiad versus your other stuff in high school. Just what kind of role did that play in your life as a high schooler? So I did everything through like the New Zealand Math Olympiad Committee. So they, they organize like a couple of tests to get into a camp, they have a camp. And then if you get into like a squad, which is like a training team, the International Math Olympiad, you take a lot more Olympiads. And then there's like an interna International Math Olympiad in September. So I guess it's kind of like how like the this, this season is per se. I, I got really into it because it's proof based. So it's very different to high school math in the terms that you don't necessarily learn lots of like complicated formulas. Like everything you do is like pretty simple, like including geometry, like basic inequalities. You just apply them in a lot of interesting ways. In, in terms of time commitment, I got really into it over the summer because I just had like nothing on. And that, that was when the camp was. So maybe during the summer, I'd work on it maybe like six hours a day. It was like very on and off. I think I'd get like motivated by a problem do it super late at night and the next day kind of be done with it for a little while. But yeah, so a, a lot of time during the summer, I think during the school year, except for the year in which I went to the International Math Olympiad, during the school year, it was pretty like um, chill, like maybe just like a couple hours a week. And what role did that play in terms of figuring out, you know, what you might want to do at university? Did you find that that was the defining thing that guided you to your major in college or how did that interest keep going? I'm a math or I am slash was a math major. Um, th that helped a lot. I think proof-based math is very similar to what you do in college. And, and in college, uh, like the classes I took were very similar to kind of math Olympiads. So instead of starting with a bunch of already defined formulas, they study the, you know, like in a lot of intro college classes, you kind of rederive axioms, use that to basically derive, you know, like the, the rules of calculus. So I think that kind of process like really helped me 
in like my first few years at Stanford and kind of solidified like my major. And, and it's taught me a lot in the startup, like a lot of cryptography, which is what we um, are kind of focused around is based upon like group theory and discrete math. I remember I had this undergrad class, Math 23A, and it was like a lot of proofs. And they even had these proof parties, a very nerdy uh, Harvard thing where you had to go along and you had to like basically pro prove a bunch of these theorems out or axioms and stuff to your classmates. And only when they'd like signed off that you had indeed proved it correctly, did you get the points for it? So you had all these kids like running around trying to schedule proof parties. It was, it was pretty funny. Yeah. But those intro classes were pretty useful. And I also liked a lot of the stats classes. What's been, what's been your favorite um, class so far? Probably my favorite class was a class called CS355, which is like a cryptography research class. Um, I really enjoyed it because even though it was like a 300 series class, it was like pretty accessible um, if you'd taken math and it was much more open. So they kind of gave you like a, a topic each week. They gave like a little bit of um, lectures, but like the assignments were kind of very open for you to like do your own research in the field. And I felt that coming from a math background, I was, I didn't actually need to get like a full, uh, you know, like a master's or math undergrad degree to, to like fully understand um, a lot of the concepts used in industry. So kind of like transitioning from math to computer science really gave me, really allowed me to like skip a couple of years and like, um, understand some of these like more advanced topics. Since I first met you, I guess the idea that you're coming to the US was pretty inevitable. Um, but um, tell me a bit about, I guess, where this interest in America came from. Why did you know you wanted to come from New Zealand to the States? Were you considering the UK? Were you considering Australia? Were you considering staying in NZ? Uh, how, how did this all shake out? So actually, King's is like a mentor system. So like each year nine is paired with the year 13. And mine was William Wang, uh, my mentor, oh, nice. also went through Crimson, went to Columbia. Yeah, Columbia grad. Yeah, yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah awesome. and um, yeah, I was like co-ducks of King's College. So pretty early on, um, I, he, he was also in Math Olympiad, so perhaps like the best mentor I could have possibly had. Um, and very early on, um, we were kind of like talking about these things. And I think he kind of like, set an example for something that was possible. I, I think later on, I realized that uh, I really wanted to do math but i also had these like other interests i also like had some interest in economics um, computer science things like this i didn't really want to take uh you know like predetermined degree at like a new zealand university and wanted like the more explorative kind of kind of degrees that universities in the us offered i was also looking into uk as well um but mm. I, I got some offers from uk universities but i ultimately chose the us because of the kind of range of subjects that I could take. And I guess when it, when it came down to it, what schools were you choosing between? What made you ultimately pull the trigger on Stanford? Walk us through kind of how you made that choice and, um, you know, what you were considering. Definitely. So I guess like my main four choices, like four options were Columbia, Penn, uh, Stanford and Cambridge. I, I honestly, I ultimately wanted to do math. So I thought that my real decision was between like Stanford and Cambridge because they had those, the best math programs. I'd already toured at Stanford and I'd like met some professors and talked to them, which like helped a lot. And then as well as that, um, at the same time, I was in like a data science internship and I started to like computer science more and more. So I, I feel it really just kind of like pushed the needle like the computer science program at Stanford and like how, how accessible that would be. And then also I had like the entrepreneurship interest. So being in Silicon Valley is always gonna help. One interesting thing, um, there was a fellow that reached out to us yesterday from the Sydney Morning Herald, and he asked, you know, why are so many Australian students studying in the US now over the UK? Because actually the UK numbers are pretty flat for Aussies studying in, in the UK. It's interesting because for a long time, if you wanted to go overseas, probably the path was to the UK, to another Commonwealth, you know, country. So I feel like this US uh, preference has really emerged in the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years. I can imagine uh, the same calculus you went through becoming really the norm going forward. Um, and some of these trends where loads of like, you know, for example, Aussie politicians today who studied at Oxford or something many years ago, uh, I can imagine that flipping and seeing a lot more, you know, Stanford folks coming back and um, that alumni community growing. But what's your take? You know, how do you see this playing out 10 years down the line in New Zealand or 20 years? Um, where do you think Kiwis will be studying? Yeah, I think this trend will continue. Um, I feel like, especially if you're going to kind of do like later levels of education beyond just undergraduate the us is really good because like even going into university i still wasn't 100 percent confident that i wanted to take math so if i was kind of like pushed into a university where undergrad i only did one subject and then masters i was going to do the exact same subject i'm kind of picking like the next seven eight years of my life as like sure. a 18 18 year old so so i feel like just kind of like preparing for the future 
um, especially if you're going to take like later levels of education, which I think that perhaps there'll be a trend that people do take kind of more master's programs. Um, but yeah, I think like the US is a great kind of place to be. Love it. Okay. And um, I guess within a year or so, t- you tell me the exact time, time frame, you boldly took a leave of absence from Stanford, jumping into the startup. Uh, pretty courageous stuff. Um, tell me, uh, you know, how did you come to that conclusion? Uh, how did this whole, you know, bubble unfold? It's pretty funny because you spend all these years hardcore getting into these great, this great school and then, you know, boom, you're out building uh, straight away. So what was that like? Uh, what did your mom say? Tell us all about it. Yeah. Like my mom said pretty much exactly what you just said. She's like, why did you work like all these years to get into Stanford just to leave it after a year? Um, and I would say that like Stanford was actually like perhaps the biggest contributor to the startup. Like the startup started at a Stanford hackathon with just like classmates. There happened to be like YC alumni. It's like what YC is like the, the biggest kind of Silicon Valley accelerator. We got accelerated through them and there was like a bunch of alumni at the hackathon that we won. So like immediately you get VC intros just kind of through the Stanford network. So um, it was very fast. It was all through Stanford. And I think the decision to leave was a tough one. So for the longest time, we tried not to leave. So you know, there was like a two, for like two different quarters. So like six months of class, I was taking like very light class and trying to kind of run a startup on the side. But I think in terms of like visa issues, especially kind of after we raised money and like needed to pay ourselves a salary, things like this, as well as just like not making the most of like either opportunity, just like made sense to take a leave build a product and then try and find a way to like come back to school once everything settled down. Yeah. I mean, it's a great approach. And I feel like the ultimate badge of honor in Silicon Valley is to get into Stanford, then take a leave of absence from it to build your startup. Yeah. Uh, you know, like that's like tier one, tier two is finishing the Stanford program in four years, but the, the top tier founders are out of there. Um, I see a lot of the folks from the Teal Fellowship uh, in, New, in New York that I um, spend a lot of time with really interesting folks um, that have kind of gone down a similar journey. Yeah, I know, I've like met and know of multiple people who got into Stanford and before they even take like a single day of class, already like leave or like delay the um, kind of start and just write Stanford dropout on their like LinkedIn and everything. So yeah, it's definitely a uh, badge of honor. That's so funny. I love it. Okay. Now you mentioned earlier, you were kind of interested in entrepreneurship in high school. And this is a funny one where we kind of maybe differ a little bit in that for most of high school, if you ask me what I wanted to do. I thought I wanted to be a doctor at least until I was like 14, maybe. And then from 15 onwards, I thought I might want to do Wall Street investing. And that path seemed very strong to me. And I hadn't really thought of the idea of kind of creating your own organization, creating your own business uh, until I probably was finishing high school and the idea almost fell fell on me. Um, and then I, I was doing entrepreneurship, not because I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but because I just happened to be building something. So by definition, I was. Um, with the, for you, it seems like, you know, from a young age, you were quite intrigued by this idea. So you know, who inspired that? Where did it come from? What was the moment that got you pumped about entrepreneurship? Tell us a bit about that journey. So yeah, I feel like um, kind of going back to it, there's like a, like a Dragon's Den competition in year eight. And like my dad also happens to work in like venture funding. So I, I've been like around pitch decks and, you know, like companies uh, like tr- trying to receive funding and like raise money like my whole life. So I feel like that paired with the opportunity and the fact that I was like very competitive made me invest a lot of time and initial ideas. And I also felt like through high school, I had this like desire to code um, or like learn how to code. So kind of like making little apps or like silly little websites on the side was like kind of like very helpful. It was actually quite funny because I feel like this desire to be an entrepreneur kind of died down junior, senior year of high school. It was like doing more and more math Olympia because I just like didn't have time. And then I wasn't even thinking about it freshman year for like the first half. And then I just like entered this hackathon on a whim. So it was very like, Kind of like when you least expect it, you get this idea, which like turns into a startup. I think that's so true. I I see a lot of folks that say, hey, I want to be an entrepreneur. I want to think of an idea, like how to think of a business idea. But um, it's it's always challenging to uh, help them think of one probably because I feel like a lot of these great ideas sort of hit you from uh, totally random moments, I guess, uh, Mm -hmm. serendipity or odd experience or insight. But tell us about what you're building. Um, what was what's the idea for the venture? Give us some background on, on that. And also, where did it come from? Yeah, definitely. So the idea is more or less crypto and like Web3, everything happens on a public blockchain. So mm-hmm. kind of like every message you send is completely publicly readable. So for instance, if you wanted to like verify someone's driver's license, current standards would mean that either you have to like trust a third party or you would like directly see the driver's license, neither of which are like either like particularly decentralized or safe. 
So we kind of use a novel form of cryptography called zero knowledge proofs. And what they do is they allow the client to kind of prove facts about their identity, such as that they satisfy, like that they're a US citizen, that they're like above 18, and that they're not like a money launderer, and then upload those proofs on a public blockchain so that anyone can like see and like audit that they're a safe person. And one interesting thing about your experience is you went through YC, Y Combinator. Tell us what is YC? Is it challenging to get in at a young age like you did? And what has that meant for you so far? What's that community been like? So YC is like a, a premier Silicon Valley kind of accelerator. So they to eat like twice a year, they accept two different batches. Um, so what happens is like more or less, it varies like 200 to 300 startups receive 500K of funding at like two different terms. And they go through a 10 week accelerator. And at the end, there's like this big demo day where a lot of like Silicon Valley's top VC firms are kind of either on a Zoom call or in person. And you have like a minute to pitch your startup. So very competitive and it gives a good road to seed funding, which is like most startup, like the first kind of major fundraising they'll receive. I think it is somewhat, it is somewhat difficult to get in as a young age. Like we were the youngest team in our batch, but it definitely, well, the youngest team that we met, um, who knows, it could be another one out there, but um, YC does a lot of data matching. So they, in all, in all terms of admissions, the admissions process is like so quick that they kind of internally know that they can't get a great read. So they, they do a lot of checks. So for instance, like our team was like three Stanford students. They like people from top universities and a lot of founders. And um, all, all three of us are like technical, like one of my co-founders also went to the IMO. So I feel like if you're able to get into like one of these top universities, the pattern matching definitely helps you get into YC. And when you think about some of the Silicon Valley narratives around, you know, how useful is college actually? Um, and this, this idea of, you know, uh, uh, dropping out, et cetera with the idea that actually um, YC is really selective based on what university folks are coming from. How do you reconcile that? And do you think that a high schooler should be very pragmatic, even if they wanted to entrepreneurship, even if they don't want to learn a single class, they should still get into these colleges because it helps with things like YC? Or yeah, how, how do you think about that interesting um, philosophical conundrum? I think it's, I think these colleges are great. I think especially coming from New Zealand, I didn't have a pre-established network. So then like being able to go into these colleges like immediately there's a, a like a stanford blockchain club where there's like representatives from like top vc firms and there's experienced founders so you get such a huge network also a lot of these kind of like new startup ideas in terms of like with three and ai require like a decent amount of like technical expertise so i think being able to kind of like these universities can definitely like fast track that i feel like the cryptography classes that my co-founders and i took at stanford we were able to kind of like line up a bunch of classes so we could like get to there whilst we were building the startup. Um, and like these classes were very like industry specific. So I feel like like different universities, which didn't have these kind of like unique programs and classes, it would be difficult to learn the theory so that we could like build our startup. And I guess being in your situation now where you've, you not only do you go through YC, but you've, you, you raised a seed round. Tell us what that process was like. Did it come together quite organically following Y Combinator's demo day? Um, what is it like now having investors? Is it like having a boss? What's the dynamic for someone who's never been in your shoes before, but might aspire to? Raising a round is a very stressful time. In YC, it's it's very much a schedule, which kind of helps because I feel like without YC support, we'll have no idea how to start. Like, yeah, venture funding is kind of like a logistic curve. Like it starts off really slow. Then like all the deals get signed and it's like done. I and mean, it takes like three days for most of the round to fill up. I feel like we kind of had a month uh, before demo day in which we started like cold emailing, we've got a couple of checks and then kind of like the three days before demo day, um, like multiple potential like lead investors, like came back, the deal, you know, it was like done in like a couple of days. And like, by the time we actually did demo day, our round was complete. So it was like very relieving to not have to have that pressure of the fundraising in terms of how it works. Most of this can be looked up online, but venture fundraising early on in Silicon Valley happens via safes. So you're kind of promising future equity. And oftentimes you don't have to give up board seats at, at the seed stage. So currently like our board is just our, like the founders, which makes things a lot easier, but we still have to have like monthly check-ins with our lead. But I think in general, it's been very helpful. Like our lead has been flexible with us, kind of taking a little bit of time off the startup to do school. And then, yeah, has been like very helpful for the, throughout the whole process. I always found, um, similar to you actually, it's really interesting. You know, I raised our first round of Crimson really. So you raised this when you were 19, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. So like literally the same year. So it's interesting because I feel like, you know, since I was 19, 
I've been on this glorious clock, but still a clock and that, you know, um, everything I do each month, can't you kind of counts and you can't really have a, like a bad month when you're building and building and building. I think this is especially true once you've got metrics, once you're driving revenue and stuff and you're doing go to market and you're getting through these different stages where like year on year growth and all those metrics really matter. Um, but I've always found it amazing because it basically brings a lot of, you know, savvy folks behind you, advisors that want to play a part in the journey, networks that are really vested in your success, people that are committed, also the equity you can, you know, incentivize team members with to help them, you know, get a get part of the action. So uh, I think the structure of VC back companies is really a good way to attract talent, align people that otherwise wouldn't have skin in the game and um, let you go super fast, uh, which I think is very exciting. And I think VCs have like great networks you can draw upon. Um, like our, our like lead VC, um, like Bank Capital Crypto, like solely invests in kind of like predominantly crypto research companies. So we were able to, we, ha we have like in-person retreats, we're able to like meet other founders where if we have a technical question, they'd like just so happen to have like a PhD in cryptography. <laughs> so like our technical question is solved in like five seconds. Um, so I feel like these like pre-existing networks um, can help in like so many different ways. Totally. Wow. I love it. The handy PhD to come and solve your challenges. That's kind of insane. Definitely. When you think about, you know, your own journey, do you see yourself doing entrepreneurship for, you know, the next 10, 20 years? What are some of the different big career buckets you've considered before? Yeah. So I think for the time being, I'm going to continue to do entrepreneurship. I think we, we saw like a decent amount of runway, like the idea is exciting. We're all building on it. But in terms of long-term, there's other things I definitely want to explore. Like you have some interest in um, kind of finance. Uh, especially like quant finance. Um, some of my favorite uh, like math classes were like stats classes. So I nice. feel like probability, like game theory, all this is like very interesting and something that I don't yet know too much about. So um, that's definitely a path I'm considering. Very cool. Makes a lot of sense. And um, of the classes you did take at Stanford before you bounced to build, you know, what was the most random one you took? Something you wouldn't have imagined taking? Or were they all kind of electives and, uh, or compulsory classes? Uh, other, some of my peers have much more interesting answers to this because the <laughs> problem was that I got into the startup like my like second quarter of Stanford. So I really only had a little bit of time to take non star related classes before I just tried <laughs> to optimize everything. I think probably the most random one was like a healthcare ethics class. Um, so it was like a writing okay. class where we kind of like, you know, talked about the U S there's a lot of like policies, especially around COVID, which are like determine like who gets this drug, kind of like how are like supply chains managed? Like, do we like equity versus equality type considerations? Yeah. This is like a, a really interesting class. Um, something I learned a lot and, um, was like a great kind of, it was gr great to spend time away from just like math and computer science. And taking a step back, um, you know, you've been running around Silicon Valley now for a little while. How do you compare New Zealand and, and the U S culturally? Um, what do you like about New Zealand? What do you like about the US? Give me your take on these two uh, vastly different realities. Definitely. I feel, I feel it boils down to kind of like the tall poppy syndrome and like the exact opposite of the tall poppy syndrome. You know, it's like obviously something New Zealand's like uh, known for in like a very negative way. But when you take it to the complete opposite, there are definitely like some cases where I, I, I don't know, like everyone's talking about their startup and their funding and, and like work and achievements. And I feel like the amount yeah like culturally it's like very different um where kind of like work is everything and like achievements is everything but like at its core i feel like both places are kind of people can like work hard and those who like work hard rise to the top which i think is useful for both yeah i think it makes a lot of sense i guess if you if you thought of one thing from new zealand that you could throw into the u.s to make it better what would it be and one thing you could take from the u.s and throw into new zealand to make it better what would that be this is tough I feel like thrown from the US to New Zealand is definitely like the kind of like startup fundraising. I feel it was like I tried a little bit after high school because I like there's like a nine month period. I was doing a bunch of different things. One of the things I was doing with some friends was like a, a like a kind of a startup idea. It was like very difficult to even think about like raising money. Being being in the US in Silicon Valley, it's like magnitude's easier. I think if you have any any want to do entrepreneurship, you really need to be in the US. Something from New Zealand. This is like very shallow, but. I do love like New Zealand beaches. So yeah, I feel like just like the outdoors and then yeah, like the culture around like, you know, like going outdoors and camping is something I really appreciated in high school. I appreciated New Zealand, go you know, growing up, but I think when I came back as an adult during COVID for nearly two years, I really fell in love with the country again. Um, and that the beauty is crazy. And um, some of my favorite moments in high school were my Duke of Edinburgh tramps out there and, you know, uh, the outback of New Zealand with uh, you know a bunch of folks in different backgrounds hiking around. It's pretty fun. Hard to beat that. Yeah, Jukavinara was really good. Um, I, I would recommend it to anyone. Like 
during high school, you need those times you just kind of like escape the grind and um, have like some like reflection. I, I thought that was like really, super, really valuable. Okay, two final questions. Question one, what advice would you give a 14 year old Nathaniel? I'd say like, find what you're passionate about. This is like very cliche. I, I think ultimately, like in high school, there were times I tried to do a lot. I was never like very strong in English. And there was like a couple of years where I really like pushed myself to be like the best student of English. And that was kind of like a lost cause from the start. So I think kind of like figuring out early on what you're good at and passionate about and like really kind of pushing yourself and like giving yourself time to explore that. Oh, this, is a, this is a small one, but I feel like um, something I re- maybe regret from high school is like missing out on like team sports. Um, I feel like mm. there's something which is, this is, yeah, I guess like a completely uh, different direction, but um, kind of like being well balanced um, and kind of like having like different activities you participate in, which aren't just grinding away at like, uh math or school um and i think yeah being more well balanced and final question if you compare yourself uh today to back in high school um you're obviously going super hard in high school which environment was actually more stressful uh was it in new zealand or was it now in stanford now doing entrepreneurship and uh yeah how do those two realities compare for you mentally i would say senior year at kings or year 13 at kings was pretty <laughs> brutal like you oh you took more levels than me but i had um eight a levels at the end of year 13 and multiple NCA scholarships and admissions essays to write. And those like two months were perhaps like the worst two months of my life. So I, I think that that was pretty terrible. I'd say the work in the startup ecosystem is maybe, it is more continuous. Like there's always something to do. Like I never really have like a full holiday. There's always like emails to respond to, like calls to hop on. Um, and, and it's like stressful because, um, you know, like things are very high stakes, but it's maybe like less of a day-to-day grind than um you know like some periods you get in high school the eight a level blitz huh no i know what it's like i do i have an occasional occasual nightmare back to year 13 that was, that yeah. was so hard anyway um good stuff there's times i'm like oh i've had three coffees today it's so bad and i think i was like whoa i was drinking like five coffees a day at the end of year 13 and, and just wow. sleeping like five five hours a night like what was just i doing grinding. with myself yeah um, fantastic but, uh, well, yeah. incredibly exciting story, Nathaniel. Um, I think uh, many of our students will be no doubt chasing the YC dream after hearing this. Thanks so much for your time and we'll be cheering you on for your startup. Great, yeah. Cheers, Jamie. Yeah, thanks a lot for doing this. And uh, yeah, uh, have a good one. Mm-hmm.